what are we looking at here? Well, this is actually a Land Rover Parenti. Now, what is a Parenti? A Parenti is actually a large lizard. And this large lizard particularly lives around the region of Ayers Rock or Uluru. And it is the top predator in its environment. So it's very befitting that a vehicle of this nature has been named after such a lizard. Now, this vehicle has so many different specs and so many different variants, I simply can't go into all of them in just one video. But I'll cover as much as I can and as much as I can rattle off the top of my head. This vehicle has a unique history. It has a unique history with me, but it also has a unique history with itself. It was produced in December of 1989, and it started off life in the SAS. The SAS are renowned for obviously pushing their equipment right to the edge, and this vehicle certainly had that coming. One of the great things about it, though, is if you get a vehicle that has been used by the SAS, they tend to replace everything inside it, because the SAS, obviously, most of the time are operating behind enemy lines, and they can't afford for their equipment to fail. And the Australian Ar Army certainly does not cut any corners when it comes to maintenance. So everything underneath the vehicle has either been rebuilt or it has been modified, overhauled or whatever. Um, going through the actual log, and you actually do get a log when you purchase one of these, it's had a new front end put in it, I believe it's had a new gearbox put in it at some stage, it's definitely had a new clutch put in it too, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Then about 10 years later, it was transported over to New South Wales. Over in New South Wales, it got fitted for radio. And this means that a 24 volt circuit was fitted in addition to the 12 volt circuit that was already within the car. A large generator was fitted underneath the bonnet so it would be able to power four, four uh, 24 volt lead acid batteries. And these would actually power the radios inside the car. Typically it started off life, or would have started off life, with the 77 HF set. And the 77 HF set, as the name suggests, were built in 1977. And they are a heavy, somewhat cumbersome piece of kit. Later in life it would have been fitted out with the Raven units, and these are a much more refined radio unit in themselves. And we'll go into that later in the video. After that, it was decommissioned as a FFR and then was absconded over to Logistics where it saw service back once again in Western Australia at Welshpool, or Welshpool Barracks, I believe. It was then decommissioned in, in 2015, I believe, and that's when I picked it up. I actually purchased this vehicle not from a civilian owner, I'm the first civilian owner of this vehicle. Um, I purchased it in, I think, June of 2015. And I did it by purchasing it online, on my phone, on a lunch break. And I hadn't even seen the vehicle. So my story starts there. And basically, I, I flew down to Perth, I picked up the vehicle. Um, I got all the documentation signed off, which you have to do, you have to play it by the rules. And then I took it on a 1200 kilometre trek all the way back to Kalgoorlie, uh, not going on any major roads. About four or five hundred k's of that was on uh, dirt roads, and the last 200 was actually on dirt tracks, and it handled superbly, I had no problem at all. The reason why I bought the vehicle was because once we did our trip, Damon and myself, across Australia in our Land Rover Series 2, which you can see in our Series Seriously Series heading west, I decided, well, I have a half decent job, I should go out and I should get a brand new car. And I looked around at a number of different vehicles, I didn't just look at Land Rovers, I'm not completely one-eyed, and what I found is that, yes, they were very expensive, yes, they were very good cars, but I couldn't really do a lot to them. And if anything went wrong, I'd be completely, utterly stuffed. I'd spent a bit of time in the reserves, and I had a bit of an understanding, a very little understanding, of what was actually done to these vehicles as routine maintenance. Even just the checks that were actually done to the vehicles themselves uh, is very, very thorough. 
and I always wanted to own a ex-military vehicle. One of the first vehicles I actually wanted to purchase um, after I got my first four-wheel drive was a World War II Willys Jeep, but they were just too scarce and they were too expensive um, at the time. And that's obviously what led me to go and get the Series 2 Land Rover and started my love affair with the vehicles. But the other reason why I bought this vehicle is I'd moved 5,000 kilometres to a completely and utterly different part of the world. And I wanted to treat it as an experience. And I wanted the ability to actually go out and explore this fantastic part of the world. Not saying that I couldn't do it in the Series 2, but I wanted to take the Series 2 off the road a bit and give it a bit of a birthday and tidy up a few things and do a few things to it that I hadn't been able to afford to do in the past. And this vehicle has support, has, this vehicle has actually performed superbly. I bought it with 110,000 kilometres on the clock, that is original kilometres, and the logbook matches that. So for, you know, 20, close to 20, 30 year old vehicle, that's really quite impressive. And I've put 40,000 kilometres on the clock in this vehicle. I actually spent six months of last year doing remote exploration work, uh, doing soil sampling out towards Laverton. And I actually had to live and rely on this vehicle. So I was living out of the back of it, using it day to day, and it didn't falter at all. Um, we had to obviously make our own tracks through some bushland and all the rest, and it was perfect. Uh, it was the perfect vehicle for the job. But anyway, that's enough about my relationship with the vehicle and the history of the vehicle. Let's have a closer look at it and see some of the unique modifications that this vehicle has and has to offer. Depth with this, and I'll try and keep it as brief as I can, but there's just so much on this car, it's not funny. So, this bull bar here is uh, the early variant of the bull bar that came out on the Parenti. I believe these were discontinued after about 1990. Uh, that's, that's my opinion, so I stand corrected. The reason why they changed the bull bar was because of the uh, configuration that they've got here. If I hit a cow, or emu or a kangaroo, and God forbid all three, this is actually going to bend around and damage the guard and that'll actually crumple in on the front tyre, making the vehicle, you know, no good to go. So what they actually did is they extended the girder-like bumper of the Land Rover out either side, and this hoop actually came down, or comes down, and actually welds onto the top, making it much more robust. The other thing that you may see is that we've got these large recovery points here and here. Now, these aren't just recovery points. Um, like many things on this vehicle, it actually has a few different um, uses, you could say. And these are actually the helicopter points that are actually on the front and on the back of the vehicle. And a sling would be put through here and here, and obviously they would then come up and be joined at the top, and this would go under a large helicopter. And so this vehicle is what they call air portable. So it can be brought in or pulled out of combat zone. So it makes it really, really cool vehicle. And, you know, a lot of people have said to me, well, that's, that's not very practical, Jeff. I don't care, it's just cool. <laughs> so who, who doesn't want to be able to say that their car can be picked up by a helicopter, you know? Anyway, that's just my opinion there. So obviously the vehicle itself is fitted with uh, protectors for the headlights which are fantastic it's also fitted with convoy lights on either side too and i'll go in greater detail about the convoy lights when we get to the back of the vehicle anyway we'll have a look under the bonnet and i'll show you the mighty powerhouse of the land rover parenti of the land rover parenti now, this is a 3.9 litre Isuzu motor. I know, shock horror. Now, the reason why it is an Isuzu motor and not the two and a quarter litre Land Rover motor is actually quite interesting. So in the development of the vehicle, one of the specifications that the Australian Army actually had was that the 
vehicle had to have a three litre diesel engine. The two and a quarter litre diesel motor just didn't have enough power for what they were after. Land Rover obviously had a deal with Isuzu um, in the early 1980s. I don't know the ins and outs of the deal myself, but it was actually an op optional extra to be able to get an Isuzu diesel. And you could get this in the Land Rover Stage 1, and this was something that Land Rover did at Sorry Hill. So it wasn't an aftermarket modification. You could actually get it as an optional extra. Obviously, many of you know Isuzu and that the fact that the brand is renowned for building fantastic trucks. Now, building a truck is a lot different to building a car. A car has a lifespan of about 400,000 kilometers, whereas a truck might need to accomplish a few million in its lifetime. This means that the Isuzu motor and products are designed to obviously have minimal maintenance and obviously be very tough and very durable and that is very much the case with this motor here. One of the fantastic things I love about this motor is I was actually looking at how to do the timing and it doesn't actually have a timing belt or timing chain it's purely cog driven just as you would get with like a stationary motor or a single piston motor that you'd find on a motorcycle so it's very very simple in its design. Obviously you've got the injector pump over here We've then obviously got four injectors naturally aspirated for the four cylinders of the motor too. And really that's about it. There's, there's not much more to the motor than that. Apart from changing the oil and doing your routine checks, they just go and go and go. Generally I've heard you get about 500,000 kilometres out of these before you need a rebuild. And obviously taking good care of them doing regular oil changes every 5,000 kilometers or 3,000 miles makes all the difference. Apart from that and being fitted with a Hitachi, I believe it's a Hitachi uh, um, alternator, everything else is Land Rover. The radiator is Land Rover. The air cleaner is your typical Land Rover air cleaner that was found on the counties of the late 1980s and the same with your brake booster, your clutch, uh, master cylinder and all the rest. So sourcing parts really isn't much of a problem. It's getting a little bit interesting getting parts for the Isuzu's but you can still get them, you just have to be a bit crafty about it. On this side obviously we've got the standard Land Rover heater box, exhaust manifold, uh, we've got our breather here too, um, obviously these are the pipes uh, for the coolant that go to the heater box. The heater actually works quite well uh, for a Land Rover heater, uh, which is surprising. Um, and for a Land Rover heater to work well, what it actually has to do is prevent you from getting fo uh, frostbite. So it's, it's managed to do that. Now, I'll just move the camera because I want to show you something really, really interesting uh, below the actual alternator itself. It's quite hard to see, but below here is actually the generator. And this is the generator that was used to obviously generate the power for the four 24 volt uh, batteries in the back of the vehicle to actually power the radios. Now, the specs of the generator evade me, but um, if you want to learn more, uh, please check out Ramilar, uh, Registry of Military Land Rovers, I believe, and it's an Australian website, well worth checking out. Anyway, we'll put the bonnet down and we'll have a bit more of a look. Now, the vehicle is fitted out with 750 by 16 inch uh, radial tyres, and this was one of the fantastic things about the Land Rover Parenti over its predecessors, the Land Rover Series 3 and the Land Rover Series 2. One of the things that the Australian Army stipulated was that they needed a vehicle that could be fitted with radial tyres. Now, yes, yes, many of you know that you can fit radial tyres to the Land Rover Series 2A and the Land Rover Series 3. But this was one of, one of the many specifications that the Australian Army was insistent upon. The vehicle does not have free wheeling hubs. Having a Range Rover gearbox, it is permanent four-wheel drive. And I'll talk more about that uh, later in the video. 
Anyway, I want to show you an interesting feature on this side of the vehicle. So we'll have a look. You don't actually have to own a key. What? No, you don't need a key to start it, and I'll show you that too. But what you do need is a special key like this. And this opens all the secret compartments on the vehicle. And it's fantastic, I love it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there was a large generator underneath the bonnet, and this was actually to generate the power for the 24 volt circuit. Now, where were the batteries hidden? Well, this variant of the FFR differs greatly to that of the Series 2A, as it actually has a special compartment for the batteries to actually go in. And by using this key, voila, this is where the batteries went, or a battery bank. Now I can pull this split pin out here and this platform will actually slide out. So I can then change the batteries over, or if I want to, I can hook up something that I need to charge. So it's very, very handy. And it's certainly something that I'm looking at reactivating on this vehicle in the future. Obviously being something that's ex-military, it's got all the necessary instructions and safety and all the rest to go with it. So it's quite good. So we'll close this back up. The other thing that this vehicle has too is another little cubby hole at the back. Using the key, we can open it up. This is where I keep my basic recovery gear. My bottle jack, my jerry cam funnel, and also my snatch strap. Just in case I need to pull someone out or if I need to be pulled out. So really, really handy. The one on the other side is where typically I keep most of my toolkit, so it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. It's really easy to get to. Now many of you may have noticed already that there's these funny things on the side of the car. What are they for? Well this is actually where the antennas would have mounted uh, when it was in use as an FFR. One on the back, one on the front, and two on the other side. I believe there's two radio units in this car and I'll show you in the back of the car how it would have been set up. The back of the vehicle is quite unique, so we'll move around there and I'll show you some more unique features of this vehicle. Any back of any Land Rover is very unique. I remember when I was running my Land Rover business, I had a call from a guy who said I wanted a bumper, or he wanted a bumper, for the back of his Land Rover. I said, what, what do you mean? I said, it doesn't have a bumper. He goes, yes, yes, it has a bumper. And I go, no, 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 it doesn't. You, you might be after a rear cross member, and he goes, no, no, I'm after a bumper. So I said, oh, well, you better come down and have a look and see if you <laughs> actually want a bumper. But it's the first time I've ever heard a Land Rover having a bumper. Anyway, the actual cross member here is much thinner than its county counterparts of the period. This is fantastic. It gives it a much better departure angle um, for if you're going through difficult obstacles. Obviously, there's a lot going on here. We've got jerry can holders either side and we've got rubber up here. So the jerry can won't actually rub through into the paintwork. We've got these slots here where the actual units insignia would go and slot in. Number plate light and obviously we've got a earthing point here which there's a stake inside the vehicle and that goes into the ground when it's generating power or stop when it's actually in use for radio communications. We've got a NATO 12 volt plug, trailer plug here, which typically you can fit your plug your number five trailer into, which I've recently purchased and I'll do another video on that down the track. These two points here are for your chains that come off your trailer to um, be held in place. I like this how they've got the clevets pin or the pin through here. And here we've got a pintle hook. And this is fantastic. If you're doing any off-road work, you really need either a pintle hook or a tread coupling in my mind. The reason why these are fantastic is you can do this. It can literally spin round 180 degrees. The amount of motion that you can get, not just from it actually articulating side to side, but up and down, 
is much much greater than you'll get out of a typical tow ball configuration. We've also got small convoy, convoy lights here and here also and recovery points here and here. Now I'll show you what these funny mounts are here. Just see if I can get this out. Yep. pop that there you'll get the picture. So this here is actually the rear helicopter point and this is where the sashes would go through or the straps and then obviously go up be joined together and then attach to the helicopter and then they just slide straight up in place like that. It's just got a large uh, quarter inch split pin which you typically use on your Land Rover Series 2 and 3 for your shock absorber, yeah lower shock absorber mount, um, just holds it in place, stops it falling off. Anyway I'll bring you up a bit closer and we'll have a look at the inside of the vehicle. Now the first thing that you can actually see directly in front of you is that the centre diff or the actual diff pumpkin is painted white. Why is it painted white? Well, for those of you who don't know, the reason why it's painted white is off to the right here, it's a little bit hard to see. I'll see if I can actually point it out to you. Just here is actually a convoy light. Now this tiny little beam of light would actually shine down, and still does, shine down onto the white center, or the pumpkin of the diff. Now this means that a vehicle behind the Land Rover would be probably half a length or a vehicle length behind the vehicle and it would actually follow the vehicle as such uh, in nighttime conditions. Now I'll just get back in position. The reason why this came about was it was realised during World War II that a number of well, it was realised during World War II that aircraft were playing more predominant role in targeting uh, transport convoys and obviously a number of countries came up with their own solutions at the time. Moving on to the Series 2A and the Land Rover Series 3 they came up with their own blackout system. So this is operated by a large switch inside the vehicle and I'll show you that in a moment. Obviously by having a small pencil beam of light shining on the dif differential and obviously no headlights, brake lights or indicators, this means that the vehicle is much much harder to spot. Now why can't you just use your ordinary headlights on low beam? Well the fact of the matter is, is that if you go out and, act, and you shine a torch and you, you're looking down in a valley you'll actually notice that if that person is down in the valley using a torch how far that light will actually distribute for and this means that it's very very easy to pick it up and if you're in an aircraft it's very very easy to pick up a line of vehicles traveling down a road so this makes them a little bit more stealth like and proved very useful with the Land Rover Series 2A and the Land Rover Series 3 Obviously to the top you can see here this is where the spare wheel is obviously carried which I think is fantastic. It frees up space from inside the vehicle and it also means it's a lot easier to open the bonnet up and put it down. I know, I know that sounds like I'm whinging a bit but it does make it a lot easier. It can obviously be lowered and raised through a shaft on the passenger side. Um, this is engaged by simply using either a tire iron or I prefer to use a long half inch uh, socket extension. And then I can actually lower the tire and hoist the tire up. And this has proved to be a very, very handy feature as I've actually gone through quite a few tires on this vehicle. Mainly just due to punches and due to tackling uh, tough terrain. Anyway, we'll look inside the cab of the vehicle and give you a bit of a tour in there. So obviously starting off with the dash. So it's your typical bench construction that you usually get in most of your series Land Rovers. Obviously refined a little bit too. We've got our map light here, which works very well. This is then 
it's switched on by a switch at the end here. We've then got our hour meter here, so the hours of the vehicle can be recorded. Now, this is something to note if you're buying the vehicle. Obviously, an FFR will have probably higher hours, but it's done less kilometers, so that's something to bear in mind. We've got an amps gauge, and we've then got our blackout switch. We've then also got our vacuum switch for the center diff lock inside the vehicle. And then we've got the dimmer. Now, if I want to get the map light to work, I actually have to turn this dimmer onto maximum. And that will allow, when I switch this switch, for the map light to actually come on. So, I'll just switch that back. Obviously the gearbox inside the vehicle is a LT95. The LT95 inside the Parenti is not the same as what is in the Land Rover or the 110 or the County. How is it different? Well, once again I could spend a whole video going on that. But basically, to cut a long story short, is the, I believe it's the main shaft in the gearbox, uh, doesn't use a, uses taper roller bearings instead of a press fit bearing. Um, that's what I've been led to believe and obviously down the track no doubt I'll probably overhaul the gearbox and find out more about it. But there's a few other variations inside it too. So it is, it is a little bit different. Obviously we've got the lever here for high range, low range. Um, low range in the Land Rover Parenti I believe is 0.9 for its ratio. Uh, stand corrected there, um, which means it has a very, very, very low range uh, compared to other vehicles, which I actually really like. Um, high range, or the gearing in this is actually quite high, uh, particularly in reverse. So if I'm negotiating a tough obstacle in reverse, or even if I'm trying to reverse up a hill or back a trailer, I'll actually put it in low range and just, just use it in low range uh, for that. It's just, just much easier. The handbrake is a typical setup of what you get in a later Land Rover. Obviously, uh, it's cable operated, which, which is fine, but um, I, I just like linkages. I'm just a linkage kind of guy, you know? That, that's my thing. But anyway, I'll move the camera again and we'll get in here and we'll have a really good look around because there's, there's plenty more to see. So basically here, just move the gear stick out of the way, is the blackout switch. So by switching it up, it's on blackout and that means all the headlights will go off, brake lights, indicators will not work. And believe it or not, in civilian use it is actually quite handy. And then we can go on to reduced. So you still have use of some of your lights, your brake lights and indicators, but not your headlights. And then back over to normal. Obviously, as I said before, you've got your vacuum switch here. So I pull that out, it engages it, push it in, that disengages. And we've got the dimmer here. Now moving over to the actual dash itself. I just, I love these vehicles because they are just, I just love these vehicles. They're so incredibly simple with their dash. It's just lovely. So we've got a obviously typical Land Rover gauge, 140. It's probably a bit optimistic, but anyway, you've got to love it. Fuel gauge, we've got a temp gauge which is actually quite good. Um, some, some of them are a bit iffy, particularly in the Defenders, as Damon's discussed. And then we've got our volt, volt gauge here too. Now, this is something that's really cool. We've actually got this here, this bit of metal. And if I fold that down, I've then got all my lights here. So I've got headlights, I've even got a fuel light too, if it's getting a little bit low. Uh, I've then got it for cross country, if I've got the um, centre diff engaged and also the, where's the, oh yeah, the 6x6 six six one here, if we've got the 6x6 six six variant and, and a heap of other, a heap of other um, lights and that in there. But the fantastic thing about this is if I close this, I've got all the pinholes.
And if I know where my lights are, which I do, then I'll just see a tiny little pinhole of light come up. And this is great. So if I'm driving a car and I haven't got a dimmer, I actually can't switch off the dash lights, it, that's going to light up and a sniper has a potential option to actually shoot me. So that's why they came up with this option here, I believe. And it's, it's very, very cool. Standard Land Rover steering wheel. It's got no power steering. Um, it's got what I call Armstrong steering. Uh, we've got horn indicator over this side. It's got the most chipper little horn. Well, that's that's really going to scare enemies, isn't it? And then indicators, obviously. We've even got a little windscreen washer by pushing that in there too. And that's obviously your headlights. Headlight switches down here. So nice, nice and simple. Now, moving on to the windows, these are actually really cool windows, and these are typically used in the Wolf. Now, as you can see, they're actually angled. Now, why are they angled? Well, I was actually talking to someone about this. The reason why they're angled is if they're straight, think about it, you can't get a rifle out the side of the car, can you? No. So that's why they're angled. Now, I actually did accident accidentally smash one of these panes of glass, and it was very, very, very difficult getting a replacement. But it is actually the same overall design as the Wolf, which is the British military variant of the Land Rover. So, it's pretty cool. I'll just open up the door and I'll show you the driver's side door because that's quite interesting too. So, this little sock holder here is obviously where the key goes. We've got our handle standard tyre brace in there which it comes with and then we've got the window lock up here too so it's actually quite interesting oh, sorry I forgot to mention earlier we've got our heater controls here and our fan controls on this side here too now down here is where it gets quite interesting so obviously we've got our towing and dyno test data on it and we've also got uh, this is what I wanted to talk about this is all the preparations that you actually have to do for your to actually make it air portable which is really really interesting so if it's over 200 kilometers you've got to actually remove the prop shafts and this is because when the vehicle is actually airborne the front and back wheels will actually tend to spin um, I believe so that's where removing the front prop shafts it will therefore won't allow the gearbox to spin up um, that's that's what I've been led to believe anyway uh, mod record so all the modifications that have been done to the vehicle have been stamped in obviously the paint is a polyurethane paint and obviously I've still kept the utility number for its sale on here too because I believe that's a part of the vehicle also. Um, we'll move to the front of the vehicle and uh, finish up. Well that nearly about wraps things up but one more thing before I go is the Pioneer tool set here. This is a fantastic modification. This means I can carry my axe, pick and shovel on the bonnet of the vehicle. By carrying it on the bonnet of the vehicle I never ever forget it when I'm heading out in the bush. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Unique 4x4. This vehicle obviously has a very unique tail and a unique heritage behind it. But this series isn't all about Land Rovers. No, we want to look at some other vehicles that aren't Land Rovers, with a unique history and a unique tail behind them. So if you believe that you have a vehicle of this nature, and you think that you have a unique tale to tell, then please leave a comment below, get in touch with us via Facebook, or simply leave us a message via our website at seriouslyseries.com.au. As I always say, if you want to see more videos like this, please click on the subscribe button below, and please help us out by supporting us on Patreon. Okay, catch you later.